Good morning again. I said just a little bit ago that <coughs> with it being Palm Sunday, um, I like what Jeff said that we got to see a God that we prayed to this week, a God who answered prayers. Many requests were lifted up this week, and we got to see God work. We got to see the things in which He did. And now, as we think about entering into what we can consider Holy Week, um, Passover, all the things that goes into uh, the week leading up to the crucifixion. Uh, we're in Matthew 21 this morning, triumphant entry. Last week it was interesting as we considered we were dining with Lazarus, who Jesus had just raised from the dead. He's reclining at a table. Mary is worshiping Jesus and anointing his feet and drying and washing with her hair. Judas is sitting there, and each person reveals who they are. Judas, in his own way, says and looks, that this ointment been sold and the sum given to the poor. Jesus knows who Judas is, knows what Judas is going to do, and we see that each person reveals their character. But following all the things that took place there, the crowds are outside, the religious leaders are saying, we need to get Lazarus and we need to, we need to kill him again. Uh, because what's going to happen if we don't understand this? We are entering a Passover time. The crowd in Jerusalem and the surrounding area has grown five or six times what the crowd would normally be. So the the, the audience to which would be surrounding Jesus was larger than at any point what it would be any other time. And so there's people out there saying they just want to see Lazarus. They want to see this man that has claimed that Jesus brought him back to life. Now, if you'll remember in the Gospels, many, many times when Jesus would heal somebody, when he would open blinded eyes, the statement to which Jesus would always tell them, go and tell no one. Now as we enter the latter part of the Gospel of Matthew and as we enter into all the things that Jesus is doing, he boldly raises Lazarus back to life. He boldly does these great acts and we said it was almost in a defiance because he does it before the religious leaders. He doesn't say, hey, don't go tell anyone. As a matter of fact, he allows them to go and say, hey, who has done this for them? And uh, you see that there's no uh, proclamation to them, hey, don't go tell anybody. And here's Jesus in this moment that the very next day, after dining with Lazarus at the table, the next day was what we now consider Palm Sunday, but the very next day was what we consider the triumphant entry that would take place. And there's so many things that can be taken from this. There is a nature that we see of Jesus that we see his kindness, we see who he is, his, his boldness in this, uh, in this passage. We see that even in the book of Matthew, so much has taken place in the Gospel of Matthew, but eight chapters of Matthew will uh, contain just this last week uh, of what we're getting ready to go through here leading up to Easter. So literally a quarter of the book of Matthew contains all of this week. So much contained within this small period. Now understand the Gospels don't contain the life of Jesus. Even John said if, the, if he were to write everything, the books of the world, he supposed the books of the world cannot contain all the works of Jesus. But I want you to understand that eight chapters are going to deal with all of this. We're not going to go through eight chapters this morning, don't worry. But we're going to cover here just a few verses in Matthew 17. But I want you to see that what we have with Jesus, all the things leading into this passage, there is a way in which we have this beginning portion, this uh, eight chapters that are going to end this book 
Uh, there's the triumphant entry. There is uh, Jesus is going to overthrow the temple. Jesus is going to establish the Lord's Supper. Jesus is going to be crucified. Jesus is going to raise from the dead. All of these things are going to happen in just a week. So many. Uh, he's going to be betrayed within there. We see so much contained within such a short period of time. And we begin this morning, though, in uh, Matthew uh, 21 and 1. Um, and um, we, uh, we look at uh, where uh, that says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage, uh, to the Mount of Olives, uh, then Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and sat uh, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. We'll stop there for just a few. And as we consider this morning, we're looking at a king. We've been looking at the things that get confusing, the, the misunderstanding of the cross. We're looking today at a king misunderstood. And we're looking today at our king. Jesus, as he enters here, Jerusalem, as he enters the city, there is so much to our king that sometimes we don't look at or consider. And even in the very first part of that, as Jesus takes and speaks to his disciples to go get this cult for him, there is a speaking and a change in from what we see, the humble and the servant, the one that was. Jesus changes the inflection of who he was to who he is. Let's pray this morning as we break into our King on this Palm Sunday. Father, we thank you this morning for our ability to gather together and to speak your word today. God, I pray that you would give us liberty, give us a word to speak. God, open our hearts to receive. We thank you, God, for what this time means to us. For God, you sending your Son to die for us, for giving us salvation, for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, I pray this morning that we could see you for who you are to us, that we could lift you high and praise you for the God that you are. God, speak to our hearts now and direct us, we ask. Set other things aside for just a moment that we can direct our attention on you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. As we look here this morning, we see within this passage that Jesus is entering here, and this isn't like some form of magic or anything that Jesus is performing, but he is essentially showing his nature of who he is. Jesus is directing their attention to the fact that for once 
those who had any doubt or those who may have misunderstood or did not realize before, he is showing that he is God in this instance. Now, the problem that sometimes we miss or something that we may mistake is Jesus didn't enter the town on a war chariot. And we even see from Judas and others who would have uh, had Jesus become a political opponent or one who would have taken down the powers of Rome and been their Messiah, who would have been their saving Messiah in the physical aspect of what their political opponents would have needed. And yet Jesus didn't come as, as a warrior, so to speak, of what they had in their intentions of what they had wanted. Instead, he comes riding in on a humble colt. He comes in different than they had anticipated. You know, God sometimes, and we always, sometimes we'll use the, even the verse that God works in mysterious ways. God will sometimes in our life work in a way that we never had imagined him to work. He'll work in a way that we never thought he was going to work. He'll use circumstances that we never imagined him to use. Sometimes it's a circumstance that we didn't want him to use or a, a, a trial in our life or something that we didn't want to happen and yet God can bring something great and amazing and something that we never thought possible out of sometimes the worst of circumstances. Imagine the things that Jesus Christ is getting ready to have happen in his life. What is getting ready to uh, unfold before him when we think of the crucifixion and all of the uh, atrocities that are getting ready to happen to Jesus? How can God turn something that atrocious, that ugly, into something so beautiful? How can God take something so despicable, so despised, and so something that we would look at and we would think, how can God take that and use it? And yet he uses it for our salvation. We think about our own lives and things that maybe that we never thought possible, but God has used some of our darkest days to use it for our benefit. When we think about scripture, it says that all things work together for good to them that love God. But guess what? God works things together for good. He takes things in our lives and he mixes it and he works it together. And our salvation is not different. God used something that was unbelievably wicked. What they did to Jesus Christ in that moment. He took the sins of all mankind on him. When he died for us, and yet God was able to work it to our salvation. God used it. You think about God. I, I, even as a child, I, I always question everything, sometimes to people's frustration, I guess you could say. <laughs> but I would question everything. God can do whatever God wanted. Have, have you ever thought about this? This is the same God who says, let there be light, and there is light. I mean, salvation was no different. God wrote the rules. God made up the rules on everything. Salvation was God's rules. Yeah. Everything about it was the way that God wanted it to be. It wasn't like it wasn't like, well, God just has to sometimes we just follow the rules. If you work for somebody, you got to go, well, that's what the policy says. It wasn't like God was following anybody's policy. He wrote the policy. God made the rules. Salvation could have been anything God wanted salvation to be. He wrote the book. He did it all. And yet why did God make salvation the way that he made it? When we think what John 3.16 says, when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we think about that, we say, well, I mean, as a child, I remember asking a Sunday school teacher one time, we say, I, they said that we ate the fruit and the fruit made us fall because God told us not to and it was our disobedience. I said, well, why didn't God just make another tree that we ate from and we just, that made everything better again. I mean, God wrote the rules. Why did he make the rules the way that he did? God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. Amen. Yeah. You know, He loved us. He loves us. He showed His love for us before anyone ever loved us in this world. Maybe you look back and you say, oh, your, your mother loved you first, or your father loved you first, or whoever it may have been. But God loved you first. Before you were ever even formed in your mother's womb, God had already thought of you. When he went to the cross, you were one that he took your sins into account. God loved you before anyone ever did. See, the love that he showed in this moment, when we look at what the king was in going into Jerusalem, the king was something that in that very first attribute that we see when he looks to his disciples and he tells them to do what? He tells them to go get him a colt. Now, many times you'll see them call Jesus a teacher or a rabbi and all the things. And Jesus, even at one point, he says, why call me what? Good. There is none what? Good, but who? God. Now, Jesus tells them when they go and get this cold, when they go and find him, he said, if anybody stops you, he says, to tell them what? Who has need of him? The Lord has need of him. Do you notice the change here? Jesus doesn't say to tell him that your teacher has need of him. He doesn't say uh, to tell him that you're, you're a student of Jesus and Jesus has need of him. He says to tell him that the Lord has need of him. And he said, nobody's going to stop you. God had foreordained this moment. This moment had been prophesied a long time ago that it was going to happen. The change here is Jesus Christ reveals himself in this moment as Lord. He shows us as king in this moment and he shows his disciples that he is what we would consider and look to he is the divine king. We get a glimpse of his incarnation at this moment. He is a man who divinely orders them to go get a colt. He wasn't there to tell those men God needs that colt. But he told his disciples to go get it. Now can you imagine walking if I said now go down to the store today and Go get this and just tell them, hey, don't worry about paying for it. Yeah, just tell them God needs that. Now, how many stores do you believe that you could walk into or you could go get something? If the preacher just told you that to walk in there and say, ah, oh, don't worry about it, God, God needs it. I don't imagine it's going to go over too well pretty much in any place. Say I needed a ride and I sent somebody over to the Rockies and I said, hey, <laughs> Go over there and just pick me up this and just say, hey, the Lord needs it. Amen. <laughs> Did the Lord send you with any cash? <laughs> Did the Lord send you with any money? Because the Lord also says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. <clears throat> you know, the thing about this is, I love it. Jesus knew all of these things had been foreordained. All of this had been worked out. He knew where to send them to get this colt. Why? Because he is the divine king. It wasn't like anybody sat there and went, what's he talking about? God had already put it in their heart. Everything had already worked together. Everything had already been foreordained. Everything was already been put in place for this moment. Why? Because they've been prophesied a long time ago that this very moment was going to happen. He is the divine king. He is the king that we look to. And he says, when they ask, he says, just tell them the Lord needs them. And we see all the way back, and that's where this all, all comes from, Zechariah 9, 9. And where we see there in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? Rejoice greatly. 
Be very happy. Shout, your king is coming to you humbly. Now think about this. We look at this. This happened 500 years before Jesus even came. That this was prophesied that it would happen. And now it is happening. You know, we think about, we hear that the Lord's coming back. We've heard it all of our lives. How many years? How many? But 500 years before Jesus ever stepped foot on the face of the earth as a man, in this moment, the words were spoken. He's coming. He's going to be riding on a pole. Hosanna, Hosanna. Could you imagine having heard this all your life and now you're seeing it before your very eyes? I mean, some of us sit here and we come to church week after week and we hear these things and we we go, yeah, that's good. And, and you know, we say, you know, I, I love when I feel like maybe God's answering my prayer, prayers and I love just, you know, sometimes hearing, hearing the messages. And, but can you imagine... When you, if you would have seen this unfolding before your very eyes, Hosanna, Hosanna. I, I've heard that story before from Zechariah. My mother told me that growing up. I've heard it, and now I'm seeing it. He's riding in. Let me cut down one of those branches and start to. That would have done something. And what does it say there? He is, if you follow that prophecy, it says that he is the righteous king. Do you know they had, and Israel had wanted a lot of kings before Jesus came? It started all the way back to Saul. They had wanted kings a long time. But do you know this would have been their righteous king? The one thing that we always say about God, and we look at who God is, and we look at what he's done, Jesus Christ is the righteous king. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and you look at what he is in this passage. He is humble. He is lowly. He is meek. But as king, he is righteous. There is no sin. There is no guile. There is nothing wrong found within him. You can judge him at all points, but he is found perfect. And within him, as a righteous king, Zechariah, when we see this, the kings in all the world, you may have a good king, you may have, maybe you voted the last election, or election before, or whichever one, and I'm not here to talk politics, but maybe your party is the one, or your person you wanted that gets in office. And you say, oh, I really like whoever's in office now, or maybe next time, or this one. It doesn't matter how good the person is. They're not the righteous yeah. king. We like people who may get in office because maybe they do enough of what we want them to do. You know, here's the difference between a righteous king and a leader. You know what leaders do? Politicians keep the people happy or attempt to keep enough people happy to keep their jobs. You know what a righteous king does? A righteous king is not worried about necessarily keeping you happy. He's worried about keeping you right. Right before God and right before man. What did Jesus say that there was two commands that he leaves with you? To love God and love one another. These are, he said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. A righteous king, it's not about just keeping you happy. It's about getting you right with God and right before man. A righteous king, it's not about, okay, if I do enough to please you. He's perfect. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to work in your life to get, bring you closer to him. To bring you closer to the things of God. And as a righteous king, he's not like all of the other kings who, who they may do good things at times. But he's good all the time. We used to say in church, the man would say, God is good. And he would say all the time. And he'd say all the time, God is good. God is good. But you know what? He's more than just a righteous king. What you see there in Zechariah, what does it also say? He is a savior king. The reason he wants to get us right with God, he's saving us. 
He came here. The reason he humbled himself and left heaven, the reason why he came to this world is because he is a savior. He came here, lowered himself, humbled himself, became likened to us because he came to save us. He is a savior king. And that is what, when you say Hosanna, what Hosanna simply means is to save now. He came to save us. Now, their definition of Hosanna was different than what perhaps they, what he ended up doing. What they wanted him to do was to literally save them right now. They wanted him to free them from the bondage, free them from their taxes, to free them from Roman oppression. Not in a week, go die on a cross. But that's what makes him righteous. He does what we need him to do, not what we want him to do. We needed a savior that would take care of eternity and not take care of the temporal. Amen. Sometimes we get so focused on the temporary that we forget about our eternal needs. We lift up eternal problems as though they're eternal problems. Our eternal problems are much more significant than our temporary needs. You see, if you will place your trust in God for eternity, God is more than able to take care of your temporary. God, these things here are nothing to him. What's it say of him? He is a gentle king. He is humble. He is meek. He is lowly. Many of us can't even understand the concept of a king like that today. He's peaceful. Something that they didn't understand was he was made for global. He was made for all people. See, Israel, if it would have been up to them, he would have been just for, as we, I say in some churches today, our poor and no more. Israel would have looked at him just for us. But you know what? I'm glad that God came for all men. He came for all of us. That whosoever, he came for all of us, that we could all trust him. He is the Messiah. He is the Messianic King. He is a King that when we look at Him, He is the Son of David. There is a lineage that takes Him all the way back, the one that came to save us. And when we see that even more so than that, He's a compassionate King. One of the things that we sometimes forget that He understands what we are going through. We don't have a God who cannot be touched with our infirmities. If you're going through something today, it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life, God knows your troubles. You think a God that was beaten, a God that was had gone through being spat upon, gone through being tortured, gone through all the things, He understands what pain is. He understands what trouble are. He understands what the cares of this world are like because you know what? He lived it. He lived the life in which we are living today. He's compassionate for your sorrows, for your cares. He, he doesn't sit there and say, I don't know what you're going through. You're just going to have to get over it. He knows. He's compassionate for us. Luke 19 tells us that he wept in verse 41. He wept over a city as he approached it. Why? Because when he approached the city, it's, it says the heart of the Messiah was so great for the sinners of the city. You know what? He's compassionate because he knows the needs of the people of this world. He knows their eternal needs. Jesus at one point he looks out to the people and he says, look, he says, Look at the fields, they're white already to harvest. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest he'd send forth laborers into his field. Why did he pray that? Why did he say that? Because Jesus' heart, he knew the people needed a savior. He needed, knew the people needed somebody to reach them with the gospel. But he is a king that when we consider all that he is and what he was, he is a holy king. He is the one that even more than that, he's authoritative in our life. Jesus, in everything that he did, 
you'll see that going down, and we talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning, but in this passage, I love because he goes into verse 12, and what does Jesus do? He enters the temple and he drives out all the people who are buying and selling and he overturns the table. And some people have always loved when Jesus goes into the temple and he overthrows the tables and they say, boy, Jesus gets angry. I do that sometimes. <laughs> Me and Jesus, we're alike. <laughs> you know, I got one quality like Jesus. Me and Jesus just get mad and throw stuff sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. At least we can all find one area of godliness in our life. Sometimes we miss the big picture of what Jesus is doing here. Jesus had authority when he enters here. Jesus didn't just go around getting mad and throwing stuff. He didn't just go into the temple and say, I don't like the way they're having church, so I'm just going to throw stuff until people get things put together. I don't like. I don't like the preaching here. I don't like the music here. I don't, I don't like the way the carpet is here. I don't like the way this is. I don't like... I better not say anything. We just put carpet. Uh, <laughs> he didn't just go in and do this. Why did he go in and do this? Because people were attempting in this moment to essentially call out the people of God, the people trying to get to worship God, and they were selling and buying and changing money. And as people were coming in at the Passover time, and they came from all over with different currencies, and they're essentially changing money, and they're making interest, and they're doing all these things with the people of God trying to get rich off of them. Now, we spoke in Sunday school class. We said there's a lot of people sitting at home today because they went to a church for a long time, and they had a bad experience at one point in that church because somebody did something they weren't supposed to, and now they hold it against all of Christianity, or they hold it against God or the church in general because some people did things they that weren't godly. It's what these people were doing things that they weren't supposed to, and what Jesus do? He didn't go in and say, thanks for being here today, boys. Well, I'll tell you what, that building fund is racking up, guys. We're going to be able to build the new temple complex. No, he went in and he turned the tables over. He got angry. He said, you turned this place into a den of robbers. This is my father's house, a place of worship, a place of prayer. And people that would come to try to give in a sense of obtaining their sacrifice to make themselves right before God, you are trying to obstruct that. Do you know there are religious people who try to do the very same thing? Maybe not to in the same light, but they obstruct people who are trying to get to God, trying to, they're doing something. You know what? It breaks the heart of God the same way it did then. The authority that Jesus walks in, I love the authority that he had. I love what he did. He overthrew the tables because you know what he was showing? His heart is for what? For people to get to God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about him. It goes all the way back to what Jesus said. He said, if I should be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And here what we have is we have this authoritative king and the Jesus begins to heal. And I'm going to finish here in just a minute with this. I want you to get this picture. Chief priests, the scribes, and everybody, they become indignant of everything that's happening. Jesus has just turned over tables. Jesus has done all these things. Jesus begins healing, opening blinded eyes. He means healing the lame. The chief priests and all these, they begin to get indignant. <clears throat> Do you hear what they're saying? Hosanna, son of David. Why isn't he telling them to stop? They shouldn't be calling him that. 
I know he's just the son of a carpenter, but he should know the scriptures well enough that he's no son of David. He doesn't stop them. Why? Because it's truth. And Jesus comes back to them with what? He says that it was prophesied that out of the mouths of babes, out of nursing children, that uh, nursing babes, out of the infants, he says that you have prepared praise. Who's prepared praise? God has prepared praise from children. He said, you all may not get it. God doesn't need you all to get it. He's prepared it from the littlest ones among us. Praise. Can you imagine having Jesus Christ before you and growing indignant at what God is doing? And I said this to them this morning. Do you, the thing about it is sometimes God can be working right in front of us and we'll miss it because we're so focused on our own desires, our own wants, and everything that we think in our heart that we'll miss what God is doing. <laughs> We'll miss him walking down the street. It said most of them, most of them were saying it was Hannah, but not all of them. Most of them in that temple that day were like, Hosanna, Hosanna. Then most of them in that temple were excited. He's healing. He's doing great things. God is doing a work. But some of them were indignant. If we're not careful, we'll miss what God is trying to do because we'll be so focused on our own wants or what we think or what we desire. Or maybe like the chief priest and those, their biggest fear was, we're going to be out of a job. Lose our position. Lose our power. People aren't going to listen to us anymore if they start believing him. You know what it all boils down to most of the time? A pride problem. Pride separated them from accepting what God was doing right in front of them. This morning, I want to ask you whether you have accepted Jesus, whether you haven't accepted him, what is excluding you or keeping you from what God is trying to do in you. What is keeping you from the thing that God wants to do? God wants to do a work in all of us. I don't care what age you are. I don't care where you are in life. God wants to do something in you. He didn't create you here, but breath in your body, a heart that's beating in your chest, or it's just to exist. God put us on planet Earth for something, for a purpose. And it's just not merely to be. But the question is, what's keeping us from that? Most of the time it's, you say, well, but, but so-and-so, so-and-so has nothing to do with it. So-and-so ain't holding me back from my relationship with God. The one holding me back in my relationship with Him is me. You ever get so mad at somebody that you sit there and <coughs> maybe something happens and you know you need to say something to them but you want to say something. But you say, they ought to say something first. And you just wait. And you keep waiting. I say that because wasn't really mad, but we had a incident, a little, little frustration over something with me and the, was the kids, and we were doing something, and I just, I got, I got frustrated. I don't get frustrated often over much anything. Usually I'm pretty upbeat and pretty positive. But I did. And just sat there, and I said, huh. Well, I, I didn't do anything wrong. And we sat there and waited. You know, some of us are sitting there that way with our relationship with God. We're waiting on God. We say, well, I was doing something and somebody else kept me from doing what I was supposed to do. Or somebody else did something. I'm, we're just waiting on God to pick up and make a big sign before us to get us back on track. 
when the first step we need to be taking is back to him. You know, it was God that had to slap me upside the head so that I could, finally I came to and I, I said something. I made it, it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't even that big of a problem. It was just me being foolish and private. We all do. And it hinders relationships and it hinders our walk if we're not careful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. And God, as we go into this time of imitation, God, you want to do something in us. God, you are a king who came lowly, humble to this world for me, for each one here. And God, you've shown compassion towards us. You've shown love towards us. God, I pray this morning as we have gathered here today, I pray that you have spoken to our hearts. I pray that, God, you would do something in us today. May we reach out to you. And, God, if there is something you have called us to, there is something you're directing in our life, that, God, I, I pray that we take those steps towards that today. I pray you just... Help us. No doubt, Lord, if we prepare for Easter, there's a lot you can do in our hearts. I pray that you would keep on, keep on working. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. As we stand for our people this morning.